Uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm associate pastor here at City Alliance, uh, and I, I'm glad to be here with you guys today, getting a chance to just worship with you and, and see what God's up to. Can you join me real quick in just welcoming those who are here for the first time, those who are joining us online? Let's clap for them. Thank you guys so much. You know, we're, we're so glad you're here. Uh, most of you know this. I'm relatively new. I don't know when I get to stop saying that I'm new, uh, but I've been here for, it's going on four months now, uh, so that's exciting. We've been, been really enjoying ourselves, but I want to continue to give you guys a chance to get to know me a little bit, so I'm going to tell you a little something about myself. Uh, I like to build things. It doesn't always come out great, but I like to build things. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot of fun for me. I, I grew up, my dad and my grandfather would always include me in the projects they were working on, you know, from building shelves or this or that, you know, whatever. They would always include me in the projects, teach me how to use the tools properly. Uh, as you can see, there's this nice picture of me when I was a kid. Um, there is actually another story with the black swan I could tell you another time. Uh, it is not related to this morning, so we will not, we will not share that this morning. But uh, So I like to build stuff. I got into construction during the summers in college. And uh, so the, I wanted to tell you a story from that. This one. We were, were building this massive addition. Like the addition was like three times the size of the existing house. Uh, that's not really an addition. Uh, <laughs> the, the existing house was 2,000 square feet. The addition was 7,000 square feet. So huge addition. And two of the stories for this house were going to be underground. So we were, there was a, a hole that we had to dig for the foundation. It was 27 feet deep. And then you pour the foundation, get the concrete in there, get the rebar in the concrete so you can build the blocks up off of it. And you got to take that block all the way up to, you know, ground level. So it's a lot of block. But um, there was this one, one day I was in the front of the house and I needed to be in the back of the house. And where I was, I'm standing at the part where like the house and the hole meet. And I'm like, that's a long way around in either direction. There's some framing here. I can just shortcut it across the, uh, the framing and, and get to where I need to go. I don't recommend it. Uh, you know, I started walking across the framing and as I'm walking across, I mean, you can picture like the rebar sticking up out of the ground in the bottom. And I, <clears throat> it ends well, I'm here, right? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> and I'm walking across and, I, and my foot slips. And like I start falling backwards, but somehow uh, my leg from like right here caught on one of the boards in the framing and I reached up and grabbed a piece of rebar and was able to pull myself up rather than fall 27 feet onto the rebar sticking up out of the ground. Um, I was pretty sure uh, that I was facing certain death in that moment. Uh, but thanks to the Lord and the luck of the rebar being where I needed it to be, uh, I did not. Uh, I almost became part of the foundation of that house, uh, <laughs> which is why it's fitting that today we're launching a series on firm foundation. Uh, you like that? <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about you know, these, these foundational practices that we need to build into our lives. And you know, because our faith needs a framework, just like a house need, needs a framework. You, I mean, when, when you're building a house, you got you to gotta build up this, you put the foundation, then you build up this frame. It's like the skeleton of the house. It's like, it's like the bones uh, of being able to build on. And once you set up the framework, then, then you can start adding those other things like walls and insulation and wiring and plumbing, and all that stuff, right? Uh, but you need a strong foundation and framework first. And if the frame is strong, it provides the necessary support that everything that follows. But if it's weak, no, no amount of expensive finishes that you put on this house are going to matter. They're not going to cover that stuff up. And eventually, you know, like your, your perfectly plastered walls are, are going to start cracking every time you slam a door shut, uh, which is going to happen if you have teenagers. Uh, and your granite countertops will eventually fall out of level. Your floors that are nice 
oak or something, they're going to start creaking and like a rusty spring eventually. Because the foundation, because the framework wasn't strong. And this is true in our spiritual lives too. Just like in construction, we can't take shortcuts on the framework because you know what happens if you take shortcuts in the framework? You get a lot of problems, right? And just like in construction, that those problems might not show up right away. Everything might seem like, man, this is great. That shortcut worked perfect. But four or five years later, you start to see sagging and bouncing and creaking. And you see that in your spiritual life too. When you take shortcuts in building your life on Jesus, it might seem great for a bit. But it's going to cost you in the end. When we take shortcuts, that's how we end up with ruined marriages. That's how we end up with, you know, we, we, we see all these, these leaders that are falling, right? That's how we get there. We take shortcuts. We try to make it look good. You don't want to have any cracking or bouncing or any of that stuff in your faith. You don't, you don't want your faith to be sagging in five years because you took shortcuts now. Here at City Alliance, we call our framework our spiritual formation pathway. We've been uh, talking about this with the leaders a lot lately, but it's my understanding that last year, uh, Pastor Nathan preached on this, the spiritual formation pathway. How many of you heard last January when, when we talked about that? Okay, good. I don't know why my hand's up. I wasn't here. Um, I guess I was just showing you what you should do. Uh, but <laughs> he talked about, you know, how this pathway it helps us in making fully developed followers of Jesus. And we take steps Taking those steps is called spiritual formation. Maybe you're coming from a church where you use the word discipleship instead of spiritual formation. Either way, it's the same thing. You know, but here's how it's defined. This is what spiritual formation is. It's the process of being transformed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. Whether you call it discipleship or spiritual formation, that's what it is. How can our hearts our wills be transformed to be like Christ. We could study endless amounts of scripture. There's all kinds of Bible verses that talk about how we can grow and form spiritually. But the short, sweet, and to the point version is this. Our spiritual pathway, our spiritual formation has both passive elements and active elements. Passive meaning like the work that God does in us. that We didn't do, God did that for us. But then there's the active side of it, meaning the things we do to put ourselves on a path toward transformation. It's not one or the other. It's not all just God forming you, and it's not all you doing it yourself. You need both. You need both the work of God in your life and for you to actively participate in the work that God is doing in your life. And that's, that's what we're talking about with this spiritual formation pathway. Um, to help us do that, we're going to review a passage of scripture. It's probably pretty familiar to a lot of people. Uh, I know uh, Pastor Nathan was telling me it is pretty foundational in planting the church and a part of, a part of our, our or origin, and that's Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. So we're going to be looking at this passage this morning. Uh, it's known as the birth of the church. So it's fitting that we're starting there uh, as it's part of, of our history. Uh, but to give you some context of where we're coming into the story, Jesus has just gone back to heaven, and he has sent the Holy Spirit to empower his followers to fulfill the mission of God. And since then, God has just been blowing up the church. Just people are starting to follow Jesus left and right. The church is just exploding at this point in history. So here's what we see. We're going to jump into Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, 
and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is such a cool passage. It's really not a long passage, but it shows all of this awesome stuff that is happening in the church, you know, that, that built power, and they're doing it, and it's amazing. I mean, it says, the Lord added to their fellowship daily those who were being saved. That's pretty amazing. And for thousands of years, the church has put into practice these things to continue to grow, and to continue to influence the world. And these five foundational practices that we're going to talk about over the next five weeks are connection, spiritual growth, worship, serving, and sharing. Now, these five practices are are the framework, that skeleton of our spiritual growth that will lead to transformation both in us and in those around us. But it's important to know that the purpose of following Jesus is transformation. It's being changed. And to look more and more like him every day. So we can look like Jesus. So that we can be transformed into the image of Christ for, for both our sake and for the sake of others. Both of those are important. Uh, This series is actually something that you guys have kind of asked for. (laughs) Some of you have kind of said, you know, I'm new to the faith or or I'm coming back to the faith. I need some foundations. I I don't know what to do. And so we've we've put this series together, but it's not going to just be a series. So from here, it's going to become a foundations class where we can go and and kind of find some, some new practices or re-engage with some old practices. Uh, if, if you're new to the faith, this is great. If you have a friend who's new to the faith, invite them to come on out. Whether it's in these next few weeks for part of the series or when we launch this class, invite them to be a part of that class. It's a, it's a great place to start. But maybe you're here today and you're like, I've been a Christian for like a couple decades. I've been following Jesus for a long time. Why do I need to talk about foundations? Well, from time to time, we have to go back. And we got to look at the foundations. We got to go back to the basics because we forget. We get away from what got us where we are today. And we need to get back to those, those practices We're going to dive into one practice each week, and this week, uh, the first part of that framework is connection, all right? So, yes, I'm going to nail this guy over here, Uh, but the reason connection is so important is uh, we all feel lonely sometimes. doesn't want to go on there. Uh, you know, you might be surrounded by a lot of people. Oh, well, I'll nail it anyways. Uh, <laughs> a few, nothing a few nails won't fix, right? Um, you might be s- surrounded by a lot of people and still feel lonely. And just because you're in a even this morning, you may never have really even experienced real biblical community. Just because you're around people doesn't mean you don't feel loneliness. And we're going to talk about what it is to be in real biblical community and what impact that can have on you. Maybe you feel a little stuck in your faith. You know, saying, I'm reading my Bible every day, I'm doing the Bible app. Why do I feel stuck? Well, 
I'll tell you why I feel stuck. You don't have a home base. We don't talk about how you can get that. Connection, community helps you have that home base, that place to, to just go and, and, and get connected. We're going to look back at Acts chapter 2 here to see where connections show up in this passage. You know, in verse 42, it says, All the believers devoted themselves to fellowship and to sharing in meals. And then in verse 44, it says, met together in one place. And then in verse 46, it says they worshiped together and they shared their meals with with each other. First of all, the video the, the, with the missionaries, with Luke and Shana, and they had all the tables and stuff, they got it right. You can see a common thread through this passage of eating together, right? So all this, whenever we get together and we're eating, just saying it's biblical, all right? So uh, the more you eat, the more biblical you are, right? <laughs> I did not say that. Your New Year's resolution will not thank me. But the early church grasped that their connection was a vital part of community and growth. They learned together. They prayed together. They praised God together. But they also spent time together. Their you know, community is a feeling of fellowship. It's being together doing spiritual things together, but it's also doing non-spiritual things together. You know, Amanda and I ha- have led a small group in all the churches we've been a part of, and we call them city groups here, uh, but in all our small groups, yes, we've prayed together, and we've discussed sermons together, we've done studies together, but we did more than that. Sometimes we played a game. Sometimes we watched a movie I mean, we literally did a small group night watching Mrs. Doubtfire one time. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) We ate together often. Shocker. Uh, Like, there was food at group every week. Uh, We, it was just, that's how we built community together. There's both of those elements that are just so important in community. This kind of fellowship, though, doesn't just happen on accident. It takes intentionality. It takes doing it on purpose. It happens when life is consistently lived together, not by ourselves. It's when you're in a group of people who really know you. They know what you're all about. They know what your strengths are. They know what your weaknesses are. They're there, for, they're, they're there to cry with you when you suffer a loss. They're there to pick you up when you fall down. That's what community is about. That's what this connection thing is really about. Having a place where you can be completely vulnerable doesn't happen on accident. You have to put yourself in a place where that can happen. Community is built by connecting consistently. Can you guys say that with me? Community is built by connecting consistently. So the way scripture works is really cool. It kind of works in, the, in this incredible way. Like if, it, if you're on like online or something and you like hover over the parts of, of this verse that talk about connections, a whole list of like other verses that talk about this stuff will like populate. And it's cool how you can kind of use uh, these hyperlinks from Acts 2 to just see how the Bible all ties together. And so one of those passages that would pop up that we're gonna, we're gonna jump over to today is in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 hits on the benefits and the responsibilities of being connected. And we're going to look at at three pieces that we can build into the framework of our lives, into the framework of our transformation, so that we can keep moving forward in, in our growth. So let's look at Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, 
not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And if you look at the verse, the first thing that it points out is to stir up one another. Hearing that phrase, stir up one another, kind of makes me think of the pot, or like how someone can be a pot stirrer. Uh, if you turn on any, any cable news show, and you see like a panel up there, it's like a, it's like a panel full of pot stirrers, and uh, you know, they're sharing their opinions as if they're undisputed facts, and they're probably taking shots at each other, they're throwing out some accusations and things like that. Uh, you know, you probably know someone who's a pot stirrer, and they popped into your mind uh, when I started talking about this, but maybe you're the pot stirrer. I don't know, maybe that's you. Uh, <laughs> but pot stirrers are often kind of shaking up things that don't need to be shaken. But there's also a positive thing that can come from, from stirring the pot, from stirring up one another. Sometimes you're the one that needs to be stirred. And sometimes you need to do the stirring. But there's just these things in our lives we need to, we need to just kind of like stir around and mix it up and get to a good place. We need to stir life into each other. And there's something powerful when you get... Uh, you know, a, a Gen Z in a room with a boomer and a Gen Xer, uh, and they have a conversation. They're stirring one another up. Or, or you get someone who's been a believer for 15 to 20 years together with, uh, you know, some people who are new to the faith, and they're having conversations, and they're praying, and they're encouraging each other, and they're stirring each other up. It's not, and it's just not conversations in the group that are doing the stirring, but it's how we care for one another, outside of the group, that stirs us up. We, we saw this in our church recently. We, we had uh, someone in the church go into the hospital recently, and, and their city group jumped in. Before any, any pastor got to the church for, for a visit, people from the city group had already been there twice. And the deacons jumped in with helping to plan meals and helping to orchestrate child care. It was unbelievable to watch how community came into play. Because why? Because this individual was connecting consistently in community. They cared for each other. They knew what was going on in each other's lives and they were able to be there for each other because community is built by connecting consistently. The second thing we see in this passage uh, is to uh, encourage one another. The, the author of Hebrews doesn't just say, stir each other up. He adds in a little bit of, how do you do it? You do it by encouraging each other. What, is, what does it mean to encourage? Look at the word. Encourage. It means to put courage into someone. That's literally what it means. It's putting courage into them. I'm not talking about like the kind of encouragement that's like, oh, your hair looks nice today. Or you make really good homemade salsa. Although I, I will try your homemade salsa uh, if, you, if, you, <laughs> if you want me to. But... Yes, that's important encouragement. Those are good things, but that's not the kind of encouragement that we're talking about today. We're talking about putting courage into someone else. It's like, I know you're struggling with your job right now, but God's got you. I'm praying for you. You can do this. Or maybe you're struggling with, with your kids. Maybe they're rebelling a little bit. They're pushing back. And you, you say that, you know, someone says, you have what it takes to love and care for your kids, to teach them about mercy and grace, but also truth. You can do this. You got this. That's what I'm talking about. It's when we put courage into other people. And that's why we gather in groups, so we can put our courage into one another. I want to tell you how this happened in one of our groups. Uh... We, we had a, a group member, not in a group that I was in, because remember, I'm new. 
Uh, <laughs> but one of the group members was, <clears throat> was struggling through a transition at work, going from education to, to healthcare. And uh, <clears throat> her coworkers were doing the opposite of putting in courage, they were taking out courage. And, and it was just a really hard transition. She was struggling to have confidence in whether this was the right decision to make, whether this was the right transition to make. And then someone in, in her city group who had made a similar transition in the last few years was able to step in and speak into her life and put courage into her in a way that even her husband couldn't do. It, it's just... It, Incredible. You got this. You can do this. We're praying for you. We're behind you. You can talk that through with us. That's the beauty of being in community, the beauty of being in a city group, being in a circle of people that can put courage in you. And that's why at City Alliance, we say circles are stronger than rows. How many of you have heard Nathan say that before, right? Circles are stronger than rows. And that's our third piece today. So you see, rows, that's what we're doing right now. In case you didn't notice, you're sitting in literal rows. Glad I could point that out for you. Um, But we gather together, we hear God's word, we sing his praise together. We we get each other hyped up. This is great, isn't it? We love coming together on Sunday morning, even if we're joining online. It's just a, a great chance to do those things together. And there is an element of community that comes with it. We can grow in so many ways just by doing this. But let me paint a picture for you. How many of you like to grill? Okay, I expected more. Go home and grill some lunch later. Get some practice in. I love to grill. Uh, About a year and a half ago, I got one of those Blackstone griddles. Uh, I love it. But at the same time, there's nothing quite as good as cooking on a charcoal grill. (laughs) Yeah. So I think it was the first amen today. It was on charcoal grill. (laughs) See, food is the priority. Um, There's just a flavor that comes with it, an experience that comes with it, uh, with cooking with charcoal. But when you put the charcoal in the grill, do you, like, spread it all out in rows, in the bottom of the grill? No. (laughs) You put it all in in a circle in the middle, nice and tight, piled on top of each other. Because a single coal separated from the rest of them, you might be able to light it, but it's not going to stay lit. It's not, by itself, it can't gather enough heat to be worth cooking on. But no, you put them tight in a circle together so that they can feed off of each other and gain heat from each other and spur each other on to make it a better cooking fire. In rows, by connecting consistently in worship together on Sunday mornings, we can catch that spark. We can even catch on fire. But it's in circles that we can stir each other up and encourage one another and help each other stay on fire and not flicker out by doing things on our own. We can't love and encourage and urge each other if we're by ourselves, if we're not together, if we don't know each other, if we're not in consistent community with other believers, or if we're neglecting to meet together, we can't experience the stirring that we need to grow. We can't do the stirring that other people need to grow. Stirring one another up and encouraging one another happens in relationships. And relationships of that nature happen in circles. When we put ourselves in those kinds of circumstances, going back to verse 25 real quick, we're told not to give up meeting together as is the habit of some. I feel like that little bit of information is added because there must have been some people who were experiencing negative results, negative consequences of not meeting together. When we don't meet together, we, we miss out. 
That connection is a vital piece of our framework in order for us to continue to grow and move forward and transform. Our circle environment here at City Alliance is city groups. Both of those stories that I shared earlier from our city groups happened because people were connecting consistently in a circle, in a city group. Our groups are designed to build into our lives the connection that we need for our firm foundation, for our transformation. This group experience, the things that can come from, like these stories are something that Andy Stanley calls providential relationships. These fall into that passive category that we talked about earlier, things that, that, that God does, that God puts in our path, the work that he does. When I hear people telling their stories about how they came to follow Jesus, almost always do I hear them reference some sort of providential relationship, somebody that God put in their path. You know, they say things like, then I met this couple. Then I ran into this old friend from college. Then a guy from work invited me to church. Just a few weeks ago, Sincere was sharing his story when he got baptized, and he said, and then I met this great family. Those are providential relationships. And I'm sure as I'm describing this now, somebody is coming to mind that just showed up on your path at just the right time in your life when you needed it. And sometimes those relationships turn into long-term relationships, and sometimes they're just for the season in which you need it. But how can you identify what a providential relationship is in your life? There's two ways. When you hear from God through them, or when you see God in someone. When those two things happen, whichever one it is, your faith gets bigger. Because you experience God through a relationship that he put in your path. You're probably thinking, that's great, Steve, but I cannot create those relationships or encounters in my life. No, you cannot. Don't worry. I can tell you what you can do, all right? You can put yourself in an environment that is conducive to building those kind of relationships, to building providential relationships in your life. You can put yourself in a circle where you can be stirred up, where you can be encouraged. You have to get into authentic community. Join a city group. Get in a circle. We were built for connections. That's how we were wired. And so much of that happens in the rhythms of daily life. That's why we have city groups. Being a part of a group is a great way to just walk alongside fellow believers and and contribute to that community that we were designed to have. It's where you can be an important part of someone else's journey. It's where other people get an opportunity to speak into your life and be a part of your journey. And as we dive into this series over the next month, I want to encourage you Try a city group. I believe you're going to find that it's a great experience to be part of community in that way, to be in a circle. But if after five weeks of giving it a try, you find, "Ah, I just don't think it's for me, okay. Find your community in a different way. But give it a try. We all come up with reasons why or have reasons, not even just making them up. We all have reasons why we think this isn't the right thing for us. You know, maybe you're thinking, I'm so busy right now. (laughs) Work or school has me swamped. My kids are in sports. I just don't have time for it right now. For the next five weeks, don't find time, make time. You can't afford not to make time. You need community, you need connection. You know, maybe you're thinking, Steve, that's great. I tried it before. And it didn't really go that well for me. Just give it five weeks. 
I don't know what your experience was before. I'd be happy to hear about it. I don't know what your experience was before, but give it a try for five more weeks. See what God's going to do through it. You know, maybe you're thinking, meeting new people makes me kind of anxious. Bring somebody you know with you so you're not going into this new environment completely unaware. You're just taking a new person with you. But get into a group. And as you study together and as you pray together and as you serve together, yes, even as you eat and celebrate together, your life is going to be transformed. You're going to be amazed to see what that stirring and encouraging can do in your framework and in your growth.